Hello, everyone. My name is Andra Pizzini. I'm a periodontist graduate from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And today I would like to discuss with you the role of maxillary sinus anatomy during the lateral wall technique. So in the past, we were used to plan for sinus augmentation only using like kind of panoramic image where we were only able to see in two dimension the sinus, but we know that the morphology of the sinus is more complex because the sinus is composed by six walls, the lateral, the medial, the anterior, the posterior, the superior, and the sinus floor. And we have also maxillary osteum communicate with the middle meatus into the nasal cavity. This maxillary sinus cavity is covered by a membrane, the Schneiderian membrane, which has a thickness in between 0.3 to 0.8 millimeter as an immunological barrier function and is composed by multi-layer cylindrical epithelium cell. So when I'm planning for a sinus floor augmentation, it's really important now having a convinced CT scan evaluation before because I can actually see the morphology of the sinus. I can see the lateral wall thickness, the presence of the sinus septa, the maxillary ostrum that we don't want to obliterate with the, our craft during the procedure. We can see the thickness of the Schneiderian membrane if we have any sinus pathology, the amount of the alveolar bone left, and if you have the presence of the artery within the lateral wall. So how predictable is sinus elevation? During the last decade, there are more than 14 other publications, and the outcome is that this procedure is extremely predictable. Many studies study different type of uh, material, and they all have been uh, successful, and they present like a success rate close to 96%. So we started in the past with autogenous bone, which was like giving a lot of discomfort and morbidity to our patient because we were required to use a, a donor site. But now with the uh, BIOS and Xenograft, with 100% bone replacement graft, we are able to achieve the same survival rate for our implant and decrease the morbidity for our patient during the procedure. So this procedure is very predictable, but regardless is not immune to complication. The most common intraoperative complication is membrane perforation, as we can see in this study from Zitterveld in 2008, where 11% of the complication was the membrane perforation. Then intraoperative, we have also like bleeding. In postoperative, we can see implant failure, bone deletions, graft infection, sinusitis, and inadequate graft volume. So how often this perforation happen? Because we can see that there is a large tear in our membrane and complication like perforation happening between 10 to 14% according to the literature. So how can we prevent this perforation to happen. So in my presentation, I'm gonna go through some anatomical factor that have been studied in um, several research paper where they were evaluating the membrane thickness, the presence of septa, the type of dentalism, the residual bone height, the lateral wall thickness, the sinus angle, the sinus width, the wind of dimension, the presence of the artery and the pathology of the sinus. So let's start with the sinus membrane thickness. As we can see on our scan, we are able to study the thickness of uh, our membrane and not all the membrane have the same thickness. So in a previous study, they showed that a very thin or a very thick membrane have a more chance to have risk. So let's see in this case, I'm looking at the scan and I'm able to do my measurements and my membrane thickness is 1.5 millimeters. So according, to the table below, I'm in a low risk category of perforation. But this is a very interesting study where we can see that on a CBCT measurement, we tend to estimate 2.6 times higher than a histological examination for the membrane. So, which is mean that our membrane looks thicker on the scan than what it actually is. So, this membrane, instead of being 1.5 millimeter, is going to be actually less around. 0.6 millimeter, where we are in a high risk of perforation in this case. So it's really important taking this one into consideration when we're planning for our procedure. So the presence in the direction of septa, because uh, 
If I have a septa that is in a position anteroposterior and I have multiple septa that are higher than six millimeter, this has been shown to have more chance of perforation. So when I see a septa on my scan, I need to plan accordingly my window. So in order that I'm able to bypass or avoid the, um, the sinus septa because it's a very difficult area of a very hard bone if I'm considering planning my window exactly where the septa is. So we are able to plan for a new location of the window and avoid the septa, place our graft, and then we can come back and see that we gain enough uh, bone volume to place uh, an implant. The type of dentalism plays a role in the patient more straightforward, more complex, because if I'm missing more than two teeth, the elevation is going to be easier compared if it's just one single tooth. And if I have a, a root instead of the sinus that are going to make the elevation of our membrane more complex. The residual bone height, there has been controversial in the literature. Some studies say that play a role, some of them they not. But usually when I have a sinus less than a four millimeter, it's considered to be a higher risk of perforation. The lateral wall thickness has been investigated recently because it's our entry point in our cavity. So during our lateral wall, we're gonna make our preparation with, depending on the instrument, we can use the piezo, we can use the carbide bar. And uh, on the scan, we can measure our thickness, our entry point. And uh, in a study has been shown that um, the thicker is the lateral window, the more chance you have to perforation. So when the window is more than 1.5 millimeter, I have more chance to perforate. The angle of the maxillary sinus floor is basically measured at five millimeter height from the sinus floor. And there are two points, L and M, on uh, the lateral and the medial wall and F is the floor of the sinus. So we can see that when this angle is uh, wide, the distance is higher. So when the, eye, when the angle is narrow, the distance is, um, is closer and the narrow the angle, the more difficult is gonna be the elevation and it's more prone to have perforation. Another interesting angle is the angle formed between the lateral and the medial wall in relation with the anterior wall. Because most of the time we see that this is an area that we have some uh, unfilling volume of our graph because it's very difficult to reach. And in this case, we can see that in this study, when we see a narrow angle, is more prone to have a perforation because it's going to make our elevation of the membrane more complex. In our parameter, like the distance between the lateral and the medial wall, play a role in uh, the perforation rate because when the distance at five millimeter from the sinus floor is less than 10 millimeter, perforation are more um, prone to happen. So measuring the sinus floor angle is more time consuming and requires some additional software rather than just tracing a line at five millimeter from the floor of the sinus between the lateral and the medial floor. And we can uh, conclude that if my distance between the lateral and the medial wall at five millimeter from the floor of the sinus is less than 10 millimeter, which is mean I have a very narrow sinus, I have more prone to have a perforation. And there is also a correlation between having a narrow anterior angle and um, the distance between the lateral and the medial wall at five millimeter from the floor of the sinus. So I don't have to take all these measurements. I can only take a measurement from the lateral and the medial wall at five millimeter from the floor of the sinus to understand how is the anatomy, if it's like a narrow sinus or if it's a wide sinus. So if I have a narrow sinus, recommendation is doing your window as close as you can to the anterior wall and three to four millimeter from the floor of the sinus. This one will, me, will make your instrumentation easier to overpass these anatomical challenges. The window dimension play a role with the perforation. So the bigger the window show that uh, I have more chance to have a perforation rather than a small window. This window were measured with um, an approximate area. Basically, we, you measure the um, dimension of horizontal and vertical. And uh, how can uh, 
be explained that if I have a larger window, I have more chance of perforation. There are an interesting study from uh, Monge in, uh, that showed that the thickness of the lateral wall thickness tend to increase from um, coronal to apical. So the lateral wall thickness is not consistent along all the, um, all the wall. So there are some point that is thicker and some point is thinner. And also in this study from Barone, that uh, the operator is gonna tend to apply the same pressure with the hand. So if you're gonna apply the same pressure where it's thinner compared to where it's thicker, you have more, more chance to perforate the membrane. Here we can see that if I'm making like a small window, like six by six millimeter, my superior and my inferior wall are very similar, 1.2 to 1.8. So there is only 0.6 millimeter difference. But if I'm making my window larger, like nine by nine millimeter, the difference between my superior border and my inferior border is more than one millimeter. So definitely here, you have to be more careful when I'm preparing my window because I cannot use the same pressure all over my, my window area. Also the instrument that you're using can help you to prevent the perforation. Studies show that the piezo usually tend to reduce the chance of perforation, but we also don't have to forget that we also is our manual pressure that is creating the perforation. So even if you're using the piezo, we have to be careful with the pressure that we are applying with, uh, with our hand. The alveolar antral artery is anastomosis and is present 100% of the time, but only 50% of the time is visible on the scan. And the location is different. It's in between six to 25 millimeters from the crest. So we cannot predict exactly where it is unless we have a scan. And uh, the bigger the artery, the more chance of perforation and more um, complex is gonna be our, um, our surgery. The pathology in our sinus, like a membrane, uh, thickening of the membrane, a mucor retention cyst or a chronic sinusitis, they both alter the consistency of our membrane and is more fragile at the time of the elevation. So we need to plan carefully. So here in this case, we can see we have a fully dentalous maxillary arch that uh, with a bilateral pneumatization of the sinus, where we're gonna start with the upper left area where we is where it's pointing in the narrow and uh, we can see that we cannot see a lot of information from this uh, from this perspective but if we're going to take the um, sagittal cap we can see that we find the artery within the lateral wall so we need to be very careful when we're doing our window preparation so we raise our full thickness mucoperiosal flap we expose the lateral wall and we carefully start drilling and we can see the, the, um, the path of the artery within the, the, um, the lateral wall. We were able to do our elevation without perforating the membrane and, uh, or cutting the artery. And uh, we add our bios xenograft combining large and uh, small particle because uh, is gonna, if you're gonna use only larger particle, I have some uh, void in the volume of our graft. And if I use only small particle, this graft is gonna be too packed and it's gonna um, slow down the vascular in growth. So mixing these two together, they give you like the, um, the best chance of increasing the, um, the vital bone at six to 12 months uh, follow our graft procedure. So we insert our graft, making sure we reach the um, medial wall, we insert the graft, we pack the graft, and then we cover our window with uh, um, collagen uh, bioguide membrane. Why we use this, um, this membrane? Using a membrane, I'm sure it is gonna increase the survival rate of the implant and also increase the average vital bone formation. So we closed up and we let uh, the bone graft heal. So we came back and we look at the upper right sinus where we can easily see we have um, a septa. So we planning to do two windows in this case in order to avoid our sinus. So during our preparation, we decided to have two entry point and we use the same material 
bioscenograph combines la uh, large and small particles and a bioguide membrane on top to cover the window, and then we close everything. So what I like to give to the patient is antibiotics, usually augmenting today, uh, the day before for 17 days after the procedure. And in case uh, I have a perforation, you can add the metronidazole. And patient allergic to uh, penicillin, uh, I like to give uh, azithromycin because studies show that patient allergic to um, penicillin have been taking clindamycin, they are more prone to have an infection after a bone graft procedure because the clindamycin is only bacteriostatic. And as an analgesic like ibuprofen combined with dexamethasone and is optional. So here we came back six months later and we look at the volume that we gain and uh, in both area, upper right and upper left, we grow at the, um, enough amount of bone in order to predictably place some uh, 12 millimeter implant. So in conclusion, complex sinus anatomy isn't gonna increase the risk of membrane perforation. And we have to be more careful when I have a thicker membrane, when uh, my lateral wall is thickness, when my sinus angle is narrower, when I have a larger artery, when there are septum to my sinus, and when I'm making a larger window. Thank you so much for uh, your attention. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you have any question, you can uh, reach me through my email and um, I'm more than welcome to be in touch with you.